enough time to think about it. Life's not gonna get me down. There's nothing can stop me. Gonna make it in this town. I've got a rainbow in my pocket. I've got a dream that just won't die. I've got money my parents gave me. So it's about time I learned. With the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, many of those countries have been invaded by film crews looking for cheap locations and cheap labour. The Paris of Inspector Maigret is, in fact, Budapest, and the Rome of Hudson Hawk was, in reality, Warsaw. Similarly, this may look like London, but it is, in fact, Bulgaria. Yeah, you see, it's much cheaper for us to build this lot out of chicken wine and plywood than it is for us to pay British wages or for us to conform to European health and safety regulations. <laughs> in fact, we don't have any health and safety regulations at all. <laughs> And best of all, right, best of all, these people, they work for, like, a turnip a day, you know. We actually give them turnip vouchers. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. Look, I've told you people before, we are filming here. <laughs> <laughs> you said you wanted capitalism, old lady. Now you've got it. <laughs> but, you know, the people of Eastern Europe, they're so scruffy. They all look like they've had their hair cut by Camden Council. <laughs> I am very popular here in Eastern Europe. And I'm very proud to say that I was the first Brit to get a Lithuanian visa. What a bloody useless credit card that was. <laughs> hey, Kopak, move the feet, huh? Blow it out of your ear. Hey, Kopak, little. The inspector wants to see you. The inspector? What does he want? <laughs> I'll call you back. Who put the bug up his ass this time? Have we seen each other before? About eight or nine times. You wanted to see us, Inspector? Two blades right <laughs> It's not the Colombian bust, is it? No. It is not the Colombian bust, Kofi. What is it, then? Someone's put that cars in my office. <laughs> Who left that toilet there? Inspector, come on. <coughs> it was you, wasn't it, now? <laughs> I hate you, now. I hate you. Can I have a bottle of trendy designer lager, please? Lager, sir. <laughs> Would you like a glass of that, sir? No, thank you. You know, when you talk to old people about their holidays, they always act as if it's some kind of an ordeal, not a holiday. You know, you say, hello, Mrs Johnson, did you enjoy your holiday? And they go, oh, well, it wasn't too bad. We were a bit unlucky with the weather, but it wasn't too bad. <laughs> you act like it's the war in Bam, not a holiday. Yes, well, we had to build a bridge and live on a diet of caterpillars, but it wasn't too bad. <laughs> and then we were parachuted behind enemy lines and had to fight our way back, but it wasn't too bad. <laughs> At least we didn't have to go and see Bobby Davro in summer season, so it wasn't too bad. <laughs> Welcome to your new home, my friend. The king will sleep easy in his chamber tonight. The king? How have I offended the king? Silence! Oh! Blacksmith? Mark. Your countenance. 
You will stare through its eyes and see nothing but the endless horror of the day stretching before you at its godforsaken isle. Blacksmith? What's the problem? I know what it is. I know what it is. I'm doing that. These are supposed to be really good. They'll give you another one if you take it back to the shop. I haven't got the receipt. No receipt. No receipt. How many times have I told you to get a receipt? Do you remember the trouble we had with that spike that wouldn't go up the Duke of Burgundy's arse? <laughs> just give it to me. It's probably just a catch or something. You see? It's perfect. That's fine. That thing? Why would it come off? It's not supposed to. It's supposed to stay on for life. Oh, for Christ's sake! <laughs> Actually, it uh, kind of suits you. All right, you. You're getting away with not wearing the mask, but you still have to stay here forever. And I can tell you that'll be really awful. OK, lads. <laughs> okay, we've got VT breakdown, so everyone to the quick change area and let's get the warm-up guy on. Where is he? Oh, sorry, Mark. Cheers, Mark. Thanks a lot. Lovely lad, that Mark. He's not gay, he just helps out when they're busy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's not gay, like, he's just left with the bloke who is, you know what I mean? Like... <laughs> All right, Bobby Chariot here, top warm-up man. Here, how you diddling? <laughs> Bloody sod you then, right. Um, OK, top warm-up man. Now, we've got a bit of a VT breakdown, as they say. And uh, so I'll just show you around the studio, you know what I mean? Show you a few of the technical things. This here is a monitor, right? Like a television, really, but if you're that fast it works in TV, it's a monitor, you know? <laughs> and um, that's the sound boom because you make the sound go boom, something like that. <laughs> this is a camera, right? And uh, this is what they call, this is a cameraman. He's a bastard, he is. <laughs> He's an oversexed, overpaid, bloody bastard, he is. Do you think I don't know about you and my bleeding wife, eh? Do you think I don't know about you sleeping with my wife so she's chucked me out so I'm sleeping in my jacket? Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Let's have a laugh. <laughs> They tell you I'm separated from my wife and sleeping in my jack. Separated from my wife because some bastard of a cameraman's been poking my wife, you know what I mean? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I'm not saying nothing, all right, you know. I'm on pills for my nerves, all right, leave it out, pal. <laughs> We're a great nation, aren't we? Us British. Not like them Norwegians, eh? They bombed our house, they did. <laughs> or was that the Martians? I'm not sure which. <laughs> I'm on pills for my nerves, you know that? Bobby, we're ready to go now. Oh, shit. <laughs> There's no business like show business, is there? Like the meat importation business. That's not like show business, is it? Or the lawnmower repair business. That's not like show business, is it? Fancy a look at my new car? Your new car? Yeah, it's in the car park. In the car park? Yeah, I bought it from Mark Clark's car yard. Mark Clark from Martley Park? Yeah, I can't. It's only in the car park. I'm not so sure. The last time I went with you to the car park in the dark. Hey, I was only having a laugh. No. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I want a word with you about those 12 men you had forcibly committed. You mean... the rubber fetishists? That was the Royal Navy diving team. Yes, well, matron. If you'll excuse me, I'm on my break. Hello, Dr. Jordan. 
Hello, psycho. What are you reading? Herman Melville's Moby Duck. <laughs> Don't you mean Moby Dick? No, Moby Duck. It's one of the books that I get from the misprint library. They do cheap <laughs> misprinted books, you know. This one's the story of Captain Ahab and his hunt for a giant killer duck. <laughs> See? Yeah, they do loads of books, like Lady Chatterley's Glover. That's the story of this aristocratic lady who has a pair of mittens made for her by her gamekeeper, Mellors. And my particular favourite is Charles Dickens' Great Expectorations. That's an expose of the cruelty in the Victorian spitting industry. I see. But, Psycho, your book says maybe Dick on it. What's the matter, Dr Jordan? Don't you believe me? What's the matter, Dr. Jordan? Don't you believe me? Uh, look, Psycho. I think that you're suffering from what us clinical psychologists call... dyslexia. Whereby you get letters jumbled in your head. It's a new condition that's just been developed in England. <laughs> can this condition be cured? Yes, easily. In fact, I've got the antidote right here. Here, just take two of these tills and come back and see me next week. Crazy, I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. <laughs> oh, my right. How are you? Here, have a seat. You know, I was in the supermarket the other day buying a bird's eye menu master. You know, it says on the packet, saves two. Two what? Hamsters. Bits of cool. Amoebas. Anyway, I was in the supermarket. And who should come in but Dr. Stephen Hawkins, order of a brief history of time. As soon as I saw him, right, what I did was I got some tortilla chips and I stuck them up my nose and I started dancing the while to see. He said to me, he said, what the friggin' hell are you doing? I said, you're so bastard clever, you tell me. <laughs> He's getting a bit, like, angry. And he says, uh, yeah, I hear you've been telling everybody down the dog sack that my theories of particle wave duality are essentially flawed in their methodology. Then he grabs a frozen take-and-bake French stick and he comes at me in his wheelchair with it under his arm, you know, like a medieval knight in a joust. He catches me in the stomach and I go, what up, straight through the plate glass window, right, at the supermarket. I'm lying there on the floor and who should come along but the historian Francis Fukuyama and he says to me, I hear you've been telling everybody down the pub that my thesis on the unreality of realism is a bag of cack and he kicks me in the head. What? I said, don't start, pal. I said, don't start with me because I always finish what I start. He start, he nice. <laughs> anyway, right, like, I head butts him in the nuts, but as I start to get up, I'm grabbed from behind by Sarah Dunant, the presenter of the Late Show, and she's pissed off because of something I said down the chip shop about air item on the philosopher. Dear So, like, Sarah Dunant's choking me. Professor Fukuyama's laying into me skull with a tin of Alpha Betty spaghetti. When suddenly here we is, wah, 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 old Bill, right? They grabs everybody, but they let us all go, right? Apart from Sarah Dunant, they take hair down the cells for a good kicking because they <laughs> profoundly disagree with air observations on the music concrete of the avant-garde composer John Cage. I mean, they had to hit her, didn't they? <laughs> Things like that always happen to me. What, are you going? All right, I'll see you around, OK, you know, cos I'm usually here if you fancy a chat, you know, or I'm down the nuclear power station, like, you know, I do. <laughs> Children, children, I have a very special surprise for you. We have with us today two famous artists who are going to look at your paintings and help you with them. Their names are Egbert and Bill. Say hello. Hello, Egbert. How are you? You have no idea. It's all been done before. Sculpture is dead. You are a Nazi. <laughs> 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 
you imply that the bourgeoisie, rather than fearing the ideological manifesto of the anarchist, actually embrace it? It is decadent filth. <laughs> this has something. There is energy in this. You have done well. Thank you. <laughs> you are very kind. Nah, I'm full up. I think I'll take this home and finish it later. <laughs> really, I should get a doggy bag, you know, but people in this country are so timid about asking for them. I mean, in America, they do it all the time. Yeah, give me a doggy bag, put all the food in it, put these two tables in it, and there's a Buick in the car park. We'll have that as well. <laughs> but here, people are so timid, you know. You see people trying to slip bits of fish into their shoes, you know. <laughs> And if you say to a waiter, can I have a bag for this food that I've paid for, they're actually offended, you know, as if you've said to them, eh, can you just go out and stab a Jew for me? <laughs> Often in restaurants, the staff can be terribly greasy and obsequious, can't they? The manager of a restaurant came up to me the other day, he said, uh, yes, sir, it's very nice, is everything all right, sir? I said, well, no, actually, no. I'm really worried about the civil war in Angola, actually. He said, oh, well, what I'll do, sir, I'll get the staff in the kitchen and form them into a neutral peacekeeping force. All right. I said, yeah, fair enough. When I'm driving in my car, I usually listen to Radio 1, because that's the kind of guy I am. A bleeding idiot. <laughs> like another man of the people, John Major, I also like to eat in Happy Eater restaurants. Happy bleeding idiot restaurants, they should call them. <laughs> My favourite family restaurants are actually Harvesters. I like Harvesters because they used to have a full-sized Wurzel gummidge in every branch. I don't know if you know this, that's actually the sure sign of a good restaurant if they've got a stuffed TV character somewhere on the premises. The famous Brasserie La Coupole is noted for its arrangement of Daleks in the foyer. The Cipriani in Venice has a Philip Schofield stuffed with wild woodland mushrooms. And the Star of India in Acton High Street often has an Alexi sale stuffed with knives, forks and spoons. That's because I'm usually nicking the cutlery. <laughs> an oak tree or do I mean a manhole cover I've got a brain like a jukebox here didn't you kill my brother I've got a job as a petrol pump for the government and the cover come here I want to talk to you here didn't you kill my brother didn't you kill didn't you kill didn't you kill my brother didn't you kill didn't you kill didn't you kill my brother You're the best pal a girl ever had. I wouldn't swap you for a nap. Nah. Give us a pound or a pick and chicken. Didn't you kill my brother? I like strangling bungees. I'm what you call an animal lover. I like North Korean cherry. Hey, didn't you kill my brother? Didn't you kill? Didn't you kill? Didn't you kill my brother? Didn't you kill? Didn't you kill? Didn't you kill, didn't you kill, didn't you kill my brother? Alexi Sale, tough, strong, decisive, able to leap tall buildings with a single bound until he puts on his glasses and becomes gibbering, indecisive, John Smithman. Oh dear, no, no, I don't know what to do. Oh no. John, would you like sausages for your breakfast? Aye, I, I would like sausages, but will that alienate our middle class voters? Maybe I should have brown flakes, but that'll annoy our working class voters. Oh, dear, oh, oh I've been hit on the head by a frying pan. Should I fall over? Well, would Mr. Major fall over? I mean, oh. <laughs> Reset. Yeah, you know, that's what they tell me. You know, the doctors call it manic depression, but um, I reckon it was some mutton Mombasa I had in the canteen at Yorkshire Television. You know what I was doing, celebrity square. Probably were on a set change. Oh, all right then, Mark. Cheers. Lovely lad, Mark. All right, uh, they've got a set change now, so I'm going to tell you a bit of a joke, right? You know, healthy is a depression, you know, as I say, I'm on pills for my nerves and all that. Anyway, right, this bloke's driving along, right, and he sees this sign, it says, racehorse for sale, five pounds. He thinks, oh, bloody great, you know. So and he goes up to the farm, he says, you know, nothing wrong with this racehorse. He says, fair enough, lovely racehorse, gives him five pounds, gets it in his Range Rover, lovely cars, them Range Rovers. <laughs> and um, he drives off with the horse, gets it back to his own field, right. 
He opens the back of the uh, horse box. The horse comes galloping out like gallop, gallop, gallop. Runs smack right into a tree, right? Turns around, goes gallop, 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 gallop. Runs smack right into a wall, right? Goes gallop, 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 right? Goes smack right in the side of the Range Rover. He says, well, stuff this for a lark, right? Gets the horse, takes it back in the horse box to the farmer. He says, here. He says, farmer, he says, this horse you sold me, it's blind. The farmer says, no, it's not blind. It just doesn't give a fuck. We're ready to roll. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Look, don't worry about my punchlines, will you? You know, I'm my best gag just because I'm not some fat communist with no air, you know what I mean? I mean, I want pills for me nerves, you know what I mean? Are I'm you a... ready? Yeah, all right, yeah, I'm sorry. It's getting late. I'm sorry, Mark, yeah, all right, yeah, sorry. <laughs> OK, all right, everybody. On we go now with more top fat fun. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I used to have this pen pal. He was a Basque separatist. Kept sending me letter bombs. <laughs> I got very depressed and I decided to go on holiday. I read in this holiday brochure that they were going to give me the holiday of my dreams. Well, seeing as most of my dreams seem to consist of me falling into a swimming pool full of puppies, and the puppies have all got the faces of newsreaders and they say, Hello, Mr. Ramsey, you'll find yourself on Sky News one of these days. <laughs> well, I didn't fancy it much, really. But, you know, the only time our ancestors went abroad was during times of conflict. For example, my grandfather was sent to fight in the Sudan. Unfortunately, there wasn't a war there at the time, so he just punched a nun. <laughs> he also went to fight in the Portuguese extremely civil war. Please, you shoot me. No, please, you <laughs> eviscerate me with a rusty bayonet. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, I, I did go abroad, but before I went, I looked in the brochure, and the hotel I was staying at, unfortunately, there wasn't a photo of it. There was just an artist's impression. And I'm afraid, I think the artist must have been Hieronymus Bosch. Because when I got there, the streets were full of fish-headed people eating each other. That, or me gas eater was leaking, I'm not quite sure which. There wasn't much to do there, either. There was snorkelling, but I don't really like snorkelling. I mean, to me, that's just swimming through fish shit, you know. British people are very funny, aren't they, when they're on holiday? They just seem to wear, like, shorts and then black socks and shoes. It's like somebody's stolen their trousers. The weather was very weird as well. It was weird weather. It was 90 degrees in the shade, but it was minus seven in the sun. <laughs> Those charter airlines are a bit of a worry as well, aren't they? You all have names like Not Crash Much Airlines. That's very reassuring, isn't it? But I... What's this? I didn't have this on the last shot, did I? Uh... Actually, no, no. We've got a bit of a problem, actually. The continuity lady phoned in sick this morning, so uh, uh, Phil here will be taking over. All oh, right. Hi, Phil. Okay, let's go. Uh, and Phil, Phil, he wasn't wearing it in the last shot, so let's be careful, eh? Hmm? Alexi, could you uh, discontinue the monologue from over there? And this airline that we travelled <laughs> was Air Jamaica and Air India. Well, this one was Air Pollution. The plane, it wasn't so much a European Air Bus as an Air Tram. <laughs> so the only alternative to summer holidays are skiing holidays, aren't they? And with... Sk oh... The, 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 I don't... What, you know... <laughs> I think skiing's such a pointless pursuit, though, isn't it, you know? I mean, why laboriously climb all the top of the way to something and then to tumble down the other side? I do that all the time when I'm pissed. <laughs> People wear such ridiculous outfits when they're skiing as well. I was on the slopes the other month and I saw this bloke in a green lycra figure-hugging outfit, a helmet, goggles. I went up to him, I said, are you a skier? He said, no, I'm a tobogganist. I said, well, fair enough, give us 20 bents in the edges then. Philip Larkin, regarded by many as England's greatest post-war poet, but behind the public image of a sensitive and respectable man of letters lay several dark secrets. Excuse me, Mr Peters, how do you remember Philip Larkin? Well, he was one of my best girls. <laughs> Philip Larkin was a stripper in Alan Peters' Pink Flamingo Club in Hull's notorious slum district from 1952 to 1976. I knew about Philip's stripping, yes. And all his friends knew about that. Uh, but I think, you know, until the book was published, 
I was one of the only people who knew about the horse racing. <laughs> but what Philip Larkin kept hidden from everybody throughout his life was the identity of his real parents. They were, in fact, Ma and Pa Larkin from the Darling Buds of May. Here, any minute now, Pop, you can have a nibble on your dumplings. Oh, perfect, Ooh. perfect, girl. Now, time for a quick cuddle while we're waiting, eh? Oh, eh? best not to in front of our Philip. You'll only see him off moaning. Oh, he's a lot <laughs> Do you reckon he'll cheer up if I let him go outside and chop the head off five or six chickens? That'll take him out of it, eh? Hey. <gasps> oh, dear. What? I shouldn't have bent down all of a sudden like that. I think I've conceived again. Oh, <laughs> the golden Maria now. Come on, girl, let's go. All right, I'll just make some more bread, sugar some almonds, pluck a few geese, give birth, and then I'll call it a day, eh? His Lovely final day. poem Lovely. was dedicated to his parents. <laughs> Did I know them, Mum and Dad? They left me to my own resources. I didn't know who Mummy was. But Dad was Del Boy in Only Fools and Horses. This holistic healing is very popular, isn't it? I myself have had acupuncture. People say, isn't it painful? I say, no, no. It's no more painful than having bloody great big needles stuck in your skin. Most of the people who come to these places, there's nothing wrong with them. They should be sent away with a holistic slap round the head. The reason that a lot of people feel unwell is because they're unsatisfied with their lives. They wish that they'd been born taller, or they'd been born blonde, or they'd been more muscular when they were born. I'll tell you what would be good for me, would make my life better. I wish that I'd been born stupid. I mean... <laughs> Forget about blondes have more fun, the stupid have more fun. For a start, if you're stupid, you don't even know that you're stupid. <laughs> the stupid are one of the biggest pressure groups in the country. They've got their own political party, their own newspapers, and their own sport, motor racing. I mean, if you're stupid, you think all the stupid things you say are, like, really intelligent, like, uh, could you fill this form in for me at all? Or, uh, you know, John Major is essentially a decent bloke. No, he's not. He's a stupid, gormless twat, like you! <laughs> but, essentially, after all... <laughs> oh, this is ridiculous. I mean, I know, I know that I did not have these things on the previous shot. Sorry, sorry. I'm just getting, I'm just getting so sick of these continuity errors. I mean... What's going on? You're not the director. What? You're not the director. Phil, can you sort this out? Up. We're still having problems with continuity. Oh, for pity's sake, what's happening? That's not Phil. <laughs> what is going on? What is going on? What is going on? tell you about my theory about the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah, I reckon it's just a big prehistoric creature living at the bottom of Loch Ness. <laughs> Why on? 